shit ain't real. Come on, don't make it stop. If you got beauty, beauty, just raise them up. Every inch of you is perfect from the bottom to the top. Yeah, my mama, she told me don't worry about Hi, everybody, and welcome. How's everyone doing tonight? I hope you all are enjoying the food. Uh, first off, we're going to hear from our lovely sponsors. Thank you so much, um, Adapar. And I'd like to go ahead and welcome Matt. Hi, all. So thanks for coming tonight. Uh, we've done a few of these. They're always uh, really fun. Uh, you may know Adapar. We're uh, heavily invested in the Ember community. We have several open source projects. Uh, both Ember Table, Ember Widgets, Ember Charts. Uh, these are great components for uh, visualizing your data. So just recently, we converted them from CoffeeScript to JavaScript, and they're all using Ember CLI. So if you haven't checked them out in a while, uh, you can always find them at uh, adapar.github.io. Um, in terms of what we do here at Adapar, so we're a, we're a fintech startup, and we focus on investment management software. So at the, at the core of our platform, we aggregate data from all the major uh, financial custodians. Uh, we normalize it and we put it in a uh, data store and then we can run financial analytics on it. So we've built a custom financial analytics engine that you can ask it questions like, what is my TWR over time-weighted return over 100 accounts for the past year? Um, and then you can group by geography, group by sector, you know, get it in chart form. So those are kind of the custom queries that you can ask our analytics engine. Um, on top of that, we've built a single page app using Ember.js. So we're actually a very early adopter in Ember and have been uh, upgrading for, for a long time now. It's been a, been a fun process. Um, and uh, both in ad hoc reporting as well as uh, kind of templated batch reporting. It's all a very interactive experience that allows you to do kind of answer real-time queries as well as template out uh, reports that you would want to run on a regular basis. Um, so if that kind of stuff sounds interesting to you, we're always looking for top Ember talent. Um, you can come talk to me. You can come talk to anyone else uh, that works at Adapar here. We're, we're all around. Um, but with that, I'll give it back to Tracy to introduce the, the speakers you came here to see. Thank you. <laughs> so definitely, so for those of you who have never been to a modern web UI, we're actually framework agnostic and we have a lot of interesting um, other topics, but we do have a lot of Ember friends and I just learned how to code in May and Ember made it really easy for me, which is awesome. But you know, for those of you who think this is an Ember meetup, it's not. <laughs> um, although it is pretty heavy today. So thank you again, Adapar, for sponsoring. Uh, this is our last meetup of the year. So stay tuned in January. We're going to be, we do these every other month. Um, and you can find us on YouTube. The URL is very long. So I would just say Google it. Um, <laughs> we've uh, featured people like Ben Lesh over at Netflix talking about RxJS, uh, Nathan Hammond, who he's here somewhere. Where are you? He's right over there <laughs> at LinkedIn doing some really cool stuff. Um, Aria, who was the creator of PhantomJS, has talked about some awesome things as well. Jared Web Components, we've had um, different core team members, so React core team member coming, coming and talking, etc. Uh, regardless, um, this is going to be the agenda today. We're going to have Steph Penner and Godfrey Chan talking. Um, so it's going to be about half an hour per topic and then 10 minute questions. If you guys do have questions, the, there's a speaker right in the middle of the room. So please do come up to that. Um, and if you want to tweet us, we're at Modern Web UI as well. Um, I organize this. My name's Tracy. I'm at Lady Leach on Twitter. And I organize it with Mike. North over here, who's pretty involved in uh, the community as well. So I'll turn it over to Mike. So the, the theme today is uh, foundations for modern JavaScript frameworks. And our two speakers today are going to look at uh, two different aspects of, of a, a modern web framework. One is build tools, and the other is a, a view layer, a rendering engine. So, uh, Steph Penner works at Yahoo. I'm sure he'll introduce himself. Uh, 
He is one of Yahoo's TC39 reps. Is that right, Steph? Yep. Great, that's recent development, so congratulations there. And uh, he spends all day making sure your, your Ember or Angular 2 builds run fast, right? They both use Broccoli uh, in their tool chain. So he's going to dive into that a little bit. And Godfrey Chan, who works up at Tilda now, um, he's going to go into HTML bars and uh, help us understand Ember's new reactive rendering layer. So with that, Jeff, why don't you jump up and take the stage? All right, bear with me. I have a corporate laptop, so I have to log in. So that's a timeout first before I can log in. Maybe not. All right, so your speakers today are two Canadians, so I figured we're gonna start by singing the Canadian <laughs> national anthem. Uh, who here knows it? Okay, call. Yeah, there's a few people all right now. We're not actually gonna do it, but I'm tempted. Maybe if we do like a karaoke thing afterwards. All right, so. Uh, my slides are in the wrong order, oh, whatever. Um, so. I'm Steph. I'm going to be talking about Broccoli.js today. I'm going to go back a slide. Um, I work at Yahoo on lots of Ember stuff. Um, my wife, who is here, listening to like the first meetup you've come to, who are the second meetup. Um, uh, we like beaches. Um, Sam, my wife, actually did the Broccoli logo. Um, I like these things. I don't really know what they were. We had them in our canteen at work one day. Uh, if anyone here knows what these are, I'd like to know what they're called because I'd like to eat them again. It's not with that ramen dog. Rabbit, okay, perfect. Yes, that's that's the right thing. They're great. If you haven't had one of these before, they're super weird looking. Uh, you'd like squeeze them open and then this like the meat of the nut comes out and it sounds really bad, but it's extremely tasty. I think I ate like 10 of them that day. And then they stopped having them at Yahoo, but maybe it was because I had too many of them. Anyways, okay, so what is Broccoli.js? So Broccoli.js is not a task runner. It is not a build server. It is not a live reload tool. It is not a file system watcher. It is not a test runner. It is not an API server. It's basically nothing, I guess. Um, so what it really is, it's just purely a build pipeline. Not to be distracted with any of these other features. Its sole purpose is to be a performant, Relatively easy to use, composable build pipeline. The rest of the features, they're added around and around it. But again, the focus is to be a build pipeline. Broccoli is also a tool chain for builds. So not only is it a build plugin, but it gives you the tools for dealing with the various problems you're going to face when making a build pipeline. Um, a goal of Broccoli is to basically forget about the need of the build system. Um, when I see job postings, it's like, please have five years of Grunt.js development. That sucks. Who wants to have five years of building build pipelines? That's terrible. The problem should be delegated to a few, and many developers should be able to utilize the infrastructure without having to worry about it. And this is one of Broccoli's goals. Um, another goal is for Broccoli to give us the right tools to make the right choices so it doesn't lead us down the, round, down the wrong path where we end up with bad poorly performing, non-composable builds. Broccoli's goal is also to hide the complexity. Um, it turns out it's totally possible to stitch together your own build with make files, with many different types of things. Um, but at a certain point, the complexity just becomes overwhelming. Uh, and Broccoli's goal is to keep these things under control. Uh, and Broccoli also has the goal of being able to compose these complex things transparently for the user. So if Mike goes and has a complicated build pipeline, and Yehuda goes and has a complicated build line, and I want to compose these together, I should be able to do so without headaches. All right. So build tools are historically never seen as an enjoyable thing to work with or to use. Um, often this is because they're complicated. Sometimes they're just bad, horrible, lots of feature creep. 
full of choices, hard to make the right choice. Sometimes you're not sure what the right choice is. Um, lots of time wastes and impossible, ultimately. Is it even possible for them to be good? I, I think so. So Broccoli has some guiding principles. Um, number one, it's to try and not get into the way. Once your build pipeline is set up, you should think about your project as if there wasn't a build pipeline, but merely everything just magically happened and you didn't have to worry about it. Another goal is JavaScript is interpreted. And if all we're dealing with is assets that have been pre-built, we've lost the hackability of having um, a fully interpreted language. It's, it's actually really nice to go and mutate any part of your code base and know that it's going to react and you're going to be able to use it in your pipeline. Um, so shipping concatenated files to consumers of your add-on, like your jQuery plugin or your Ember add-on or your React this or your Angular that, it itself seems like an anti-pattern. We should probably just leave the files the way that the primary developer works on it and ship that as a unit to the user so that when the user goes and wants to make a change, they don't have to look at a um, 100 kilobyte concatenated file to make that change. They can look in the file that has the name, make the change, report the issue, fix the bug, without having to figure out how to go from a concatenated vendor file back to the original input sources. Um, given this, there's basically no single build pipeline set of rules to build every possible tool. Basically, if I'm building uh, something with CoffeeScript, or if I'm building something with ES5 or ES6 or ClojureScript, or in the future with uh, WebASM or something, um, we can't make one build pipeline that will build everything. Every author likely needs to build their own. Um, the other thing from a build pipeline is the FS events, so ch change events from the file system, they basically lie to you more often than not. Um, Users ultimately use a pretty wide mix of file systems, especially if they have um, stuff virtualized, not virtualized, they have mounted drives, mounted disks. All of these different drives and disks and file systems have different quirks and different issues. So being able to build a build pipeline that can take these into account is very important. Um, caching is hard. Cache and validation is basically the worst thing ever. Um, and in Broccoli's case, um, the user experience of Broccoli itself can be improved retroactively. There's a lot of build pipelines that exist that have been top-down designed to have a really nice, elegant UI, user experience for people to use. Um, but actually, when the problems become complicated, uh, that UI gets in the way because the UI was derived before the full problem had been, has been known. So Broccoli took a different perspective where the UI has, or the UX has been changing, uh, but the underlying primitives are getting better and richer, not trying to figure out how to change how to work within the confines of an existing user experience, but how to uh, make the right choices at every possible level and then eventually layer a nice user experience on top. All right, so Broccoli doesn't meet all those criteria yet, but it's getting there fairly quickly. Um, in the Broccoli world, there are four things, four high-level things that matter. There are trees, nodes, plugins, and the builder. Tree represents an on-disk tree of files. Node is basically Broccoli's pointer to the root of that file system or that file tree. So if you're building the app directory, the app directory pointer would be the node. Uh, plugin. Plugin is how Broccoli applies transformations to nodes. And finally, the builder. The builder basically stitches plugins and nodes together for you transparently. All right. So the TLDR of Broccoli is Broccoli builds graphs of nodes of trees via plugins. And all your that's pretty simple, right? And Plugins do all the work. Um, graphs of nodes of trees of nodes of graphs of stuff. Okay, so basically, Broccoli builds stuff via plugins. Um, Broccoli is broken into two parts. Broccoli has a declarative DSL that is run before your build happens that describes what is going to happen, and then a second part, which is the plugins themselves, running and executing on every subsequent build. So, given the tiniest little Broccoli build pipeline I could think of, we're going to take all the files in the app directory, we're going to transform them from ES6 to ES5 or ES3 using Babel, and then we're going to take the output of that and JS hint it. Um, kind of weird, you probably want to JS hint before you Babel, um, but because JS hint is kind of slow for updating its feature set, you sometimes have to do it after you Babel, which is unfortunate. So basically, um, 
the app directory is transformed by Babel. The output of the Babel transformation is transformed by JSint, and that is the full complete build pipeline here. As you can see, we basically just described the whole build pipeline without caring or understanding how Babel is implemented, how JSint is implemented, or anything is implemented. So each plugin in Broccoli is essentially another layer of a layered file system. Of course, our typical file systems don't support this, so Broccoli emulates this by a series of directories and symlinks between them. So in this case, we basically have three layers. We have the input layer, which is what exists in your app directory. The second layer is the result of the Babel transformation on the initial input layer of your app directory. And the final layer is the JS hint of step two, not of step three, like I have written there. Um, Another thing that's important to note is each plugin's input is the output of another plugin. So in the case of this very small build pipeline, um, the directory is the input to the Babel plugin, and the output of the Babel plugin is the input to the JSN. So it's like a linked list head to tail of all the plugins across the nodes in your uh, build pipeline. Um, some plugins also take multiple inputs. Uh, an example of this is merge. Sometimes you want to take the result of three different build pipelines and combine them into the same final output. So a good example of this is if I have a test tree where I go and build my tests and concatenate them, and then I go and build my app and concatenate them, in the end, I'm going to want to serve them out of the same public directory. So I merge these two trees together, basically take the two directories, and I just squash them together from left to right. Um, and the interface between the plugins is the file system. So any tool that can read from the file system can cooperate in a Broccoli build pipeline. Um, Steph isn't the file system slow. Um, slow is always relative. If you use the tool correctly, it's going to be fast. If you can use the tool incorrectly, it's going to be slow. Turns out there's ways, just like there's ways to use the DOM efficiently, uh, there's ways to use a file system efficiently. Um, for example, if we loaded everything into memory, all of a sudden we would be relying on V8's garbage collector for dealing with potential hundreds of megabytes or even gigabytes of files. It's not really what it was designed for. Turns out the file system is really good with dealing lots of, with lots of large files, not really necessarily good with dealing with lots of small files or lots of rapid changes. So Broccoli's goal is to utilize the file system correctly um, rather than incorrectly. So trade off, yes, the file system is slow. If you use it correctly, it might actually be the best tool for the job. All right, so now that we've defined a build pipeline, we know a little bit about Broccoli, how do we rebuild? Well, basically, if the system has been notified of a change, Broccoli goes, and basically tells the builder to rebuild again. And by default, with the most naive plugins, everything would be recreated. So if I had a bunch of files and be Babel transformed, I would go through and do this again. From the builder's perspective, that is all it's doing. When we get a change notification from the file system, we say, ah, something may have changed. All of you plugins, please rebuild yourself in your entirety. From the builder's perspective, that's exactly what's happening. But since plugins do all the work, they can do something that's efficient for their specific use case. So some plugins will do uh, file system batching, other ones will do caching, and in the future, maybe some of them will, do, will utilize some more concurrency. So the builder itself is extremely trivial. Its responsible, responsibility is stitching together the various plugins and nodes, and on change, informing the entire system to rebuild itself, and all the complexity in rebuilding and caching is isolated to each individual plugin. Uh, this might seem like a lot of duplication, but ultimately each plugin has a very different use case from a different plugin. So implementing a general caching strategy is problematic, but implementing maybe three or four very specific ca caching strategies is actually um, easy. All right. So why every single plugin is very different. So caching strategies need to be unique for that little snowflake. All right. So in the Broccoli ecosystem, there are many, many plugins but most of them are subclasses of Broccoli plugins. And most of the user plugins are actually subclasses of either Broccoli Filter or Broccoli Caching Writer. Um, but the four primary plugins you'll likely be interacting with are Funnel, Merge, or subclasses of Filter and Caching Writer. Broccoli Funnel is basically like the Unix or POSIX find. Please find from this directory a subset of files and pass it through the Broccoli pipeline. So in this case, we're saying, hey, all the JavaScript files inside app, give me access to them. Give me a selection of them, which is the same as app by name star.js. 
Um, broccoli filter is the next one. Um, so given the input of maybe a funnel, please transform every file that I encounter. Um, this is a one-to-one -one style transformation. Basically, uh, given app.js, it will produce a new app.js with only its content modified. It doesn't really care about the relationships between files, so it's not the right tool for, let's say, a source map concatenation. Um, it has one, of the, one at a time semantics, so it builds one file at a time. Um, but it also has, because of this, it can do uh, per file caching. So if I have an application with many JavaScript files and I go and change app.js, when I want Babel to run, I don't want it to rebuild all of my files. I only want it to rebuild app.js to keep that build performance nice and quick. And um, Babel or Broccoli Filter is very similar to basically finding all the files and passing them to passing them straight to Babel, but doing so programmatically and in a delta way. Um, the next plugin is Broccoli Merge, which basically given two input trees, will create a single input tree with a left to right merge. So imagine we have one tree that has the app.js directory and a second tree that has test.js. If I combine these together, I will get a single directory on my disk that contains both app.js and test.js. This is quite handy when you have multiple different parts of your build pipeline and you want to, at some point later down the road, combine them to provide the user with a single output directory. Uh, <clears throat> and finally, we have Broccoli Caching Writer. Um, kind of a quirky name, but basically what it does is given all of the inputs, if any of the inputs have changed, the output must change. So an example of this is if I'm doing a source map concatenation, if any one of the inputs has changed, I must read all my inputs again and rebuild the single output. Uh, this is basically, in POSIX land, it's basically a cat of all the input files into a single output file. All right, so taking all these things together, um, we can construct something that's very similar to lots of build pipelines for applications. We can grab the app, we can babelify it, we can concat it and produce an output app.js. We can do the same thing for tests, and then finally merge them together. This is a little bit verbose, but it's the fully formed version. You can also reduce it to something much simpler. Um, all the babel plugins, they support both the class style new invocation or the call constructor style invocation. Um, depending on where you're writing this, you might prefer one or the other, but if you're writing a pipeline together very quickly, um, the second example is totally the more ergonomic to use. Um, and then we could actually take this a step further and just say, hey, we have a new pipeline and the pipeline is to concat a Babel thing and produce an output file. So we can make that a function that just happens to return a new broccoli pipeline and merge trees can automatically work with any broccoli pipeline inputs, and we've now created a composed build pipeline. This is neat. Um, maybe not that compelling, but it's neat. So there's a more specific case study, and that would be how Ember CLI uses Babel. Um, and those colors are bad. I can't change them. Um, basically, Ember CLI uh, has multiple build pipelines, somewhat more complicated than this build pipeline. But what it does is it stitches these together, wraps them in a single unit called an Ember app, which hides the internals, but allows you to then compose it with other pipelines outside. Um, an interesting thing that Broccoli recommends is it recommends you build abstractions around the Broccoli primitives. Um, so one example in an Ember CLI application is app.import, which basically takes this file makes it available via your vendor.js, could be implemented by the user via new funnel. Um, they're pretty similar here. And in fact, the first implementation of app.import basically did this. Uh, at that point in time, people were including maybe 10 or 20 different files, external dependencies. Um, at a certain point, people were including 100 to 200 of them, which meant we had 100 to 200, sometimes even five or 600 uh, funnels that would be, we'd have a directory and they'd be, for every file in the directory, they would have one funnel, which turns out to be extremely inefficient. Lots of overlapping file system watches, it's not fun. Um, but Ember CLI, because of this indirection uh, and the concise API, was basically able to turn all 600 of the app.imports into a single funnel, thereby restoring the original performance. Um, also, the nice thing is we don't leak the concept of Broccoli in most cases to the users, um, but under the hood, if a power user needs to dip in, uh, Broccoli is available. 
So lots of other build pipelines, they are not only the internal implementation of the build pipeline, they are the public API for the build pipeline. They're hard to uh, hide and tuck away and abstract. Uh, one of Broccoli's goals was to be a useful tool uh, that could be used as a public API or could be abstracted away, put inside a box, and most users don't have to deal with it. Back to that goal of the build pipeline should not get in your way, and you should not need five years of experience to use the tool that you use in the build pipeline. Um, and yep, with that change, we were able to make some nice performance improvements. Um, case study is Ember add-ons, which are basically very similar to Ember applications with a few different pipeline changes. Um, internally, they're just a subclass of the Ember application um, with a few Broccoli pipeline changes, um, but transparent to the user and transparent to how Broccoli works. Broccoli has no concept of Ember apps, has no concept of Ember add-ons, but is totally able to build them because it provides the right low-level primitives for um, working together. All right. So that's still kind of interesting, not really that interesting. But trust me, this is where Broccoli truly shines. Um, first, we start off with Steph makes an add-on. The add-on is just some random code that he wants to JS hint in Babel. Then Mike comes along and is like, I have a new add-on. And I want to use a different plugin, dfeatureify, to strip out various features in some modes, leave features in in other modes. And then ultimately, I want to use Babel, but I want to turn on the decorator functionality for Babel. But in Steph's add-on, Steph has explicitly left off that functionality because he doesn't want it. But ultimately, Babel with decorators and Babel without de decorators emits JavaScript that our browsers can run. So it's totally fine for two build pipelines with two different Babels, with two different sets of Babel configurations to be combined into the same <clears throat> larger build pipeline without them knowing about each other. And then Tracy comes along and adds uh, a spinning Marvin transformation to the add-on and Babel with a different operator. So now we have three Babels, uh, a spinning Marvin transformation, a JS hint, um, and all these things just work nicely together. Um, so each one of these add-ons can have their own post-processors, their own pre-processors, different versions of all these things, um, but they share common ES5 output. Um, and as it turns out, Mike's add-on even depends on more add-ons, but Broccoli doesn't care because at instantiation time of the build pipeline, the build pipeline is um, composed and derived live. The developer doesn't need to, the consumer of the plugin doesn't need to know how they're con constructed. It's the plugin author's responsibility. And it just works. And this is what it ends up looking like. Each one of these things is a different Broccoli plugin or a different node with a transformation to another one at the very bottom is the public output directory. And you might be saying, Steph, that looks like a lot of work. This is, this is, this is going to take ages. Uh, any guesses for how long? This app is a few hundred thousand lines of code without add-ons, 20,000 lines of CSS, probably another 100,000 lines of add-on code. Any guesses for how long this whole build pipeline, this whole broccoli build pipeline takes? Uh, Nathan, what would? Nathan's guess is six seconds. Um, currently, it takes 800 milliseconds. Um, with 100 milliseconds of a thing that doesn't need to exist. And I think we're on track to getting it close to four or 500 milliseconds soon. So don't be distracted by the fact that there's a whole bunch of stuff. Broccoli is really good at dealing with very large build pipelines and producing things performantly um, without the consumer of this build pipeline even realizing that this complexity exists. And <clears throat> the only thing that actually needs to understand this complexity is Broccoli itself which a human wrote, but doesn't have to actually maintain. So every single Ember application, every single tool that uses Broccoli has a very vastly different build infrastructure, but the system just adapts to it. Now, if you were to manually implement this, you would just give up. You'd say, this is too complicated, too many moving parts. Um, but actually, those moving parts are what computers are good at automating. So again, don't panic. This is what computers are made for. Um, Broccoli just <laughs> figures it out. There's a lot of really funny broccoli pictures when you Google broccoli pictures online. Um, and in the end, this particular build pipeline, um, there's a visualization of broccoli build pipelines as I've show, shown you. This is the final output, and it's 895 milliseconds. Um, I'm pretty sure that with a little bit more massaging, we can get it down to about three to 500 milliseconds, which is, in my opinion, near instant for an application with over 200,000 lines of code, um, but probably can get better. Um, this is the sort of synopsis of where the time is being consumed. Um, the thing listed in red, that, that step doesn't even need to exist. It's just I haven't removed it yet from this particular application. Um, the two ones that are in the gold brownie color, um, 
they're the next target of some optimizations. Um, and the blue one, um, the source map step itself is the expensive part, not reading the files, not doing anything else. Uh, and um, a developer that we know, Chris, has been working on a different source map encoder decoder pair uh, that has some really nice performance benefits, and we're hoping to get that in soon. We'll see what happens. But yeah, short-term goal, 400 to 600 milliseconds. Um, Ember.js is also built with Broccoli, and uh, Ember.js currently takes about 7, 800 milliseconds to rebuild itself. Um, and it's totally dominated by Broccoli merge trees, which is still yet to be optimized common Broccoli plugin. So like 500 milliseconds of its time is being consumed by that. I think a goal of 300 milliseconds is totally reasonable. Um, anyways, so there's lots of ongoing work with Broccoli. Uh, primarily, the ongoing work is in performance and ergonomics. A few times the performance is the result of maybe a poor ergonomic, which suggests to people to take a wrong course of action uh, that needs to be fixed. And another set of it is just some steps, like the merge tree step, are still just doing far too much work, um, but it can be reduced. Future work, um, so given all of that work landing, there's still a lot of time spent reading, uh, reading files on disk to figure out if they've changed or not. Turns out Facebook has a pretty cool project called Watchman that exists, and some of the Broccoli CLIs, like Ember CLI, utilize Watchman for change detection, but they don't fully utilize Watchman, because Watchman will actually keep track of which files have changed, and you can query Watchman rather than having to query uh, the file system itself, um, which turns out to be quite quick. They're missing a few features like siblings, but they've promised to add them. Once they add them, we can totally utilize that and then cut another 30% off of those final times I showed you, which is all input tree reading time. Um, another planned work, which should help initial builds dramatically, is virtualizing all of the symlinks to emulate the layered file system. Um, that can just be stored in memory, in Node. It's going to be a small chunk of memory, and it'll prevent a lot of I.O. on disk, which will save your SSDs from burning out too soon and make builds much, much faster. Anyways, so that's it for the what is Broccoli talk. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I would love to hear them. Is this one? one thing you mentioned very briefly that caught my eye was the find and command with dash exec. Do you use literally that command? No, not at all. Okay. Um, I put the POSIX style commands in there merely to give a good frame of reference. And I found that when I was figuring out how broccoli work, relating each of the tools to their sort of POSIX equivalent was the same. The downside of the POSIX ones is they aren't incremental and they don't do any caching. So running them would be pretty uh, not performing. And if you do decide to use that, the find the DXRs command is much more efficient. Thank you for the pro tip. That's a really small mic. So the uh, the times that you mentioned before, the milliseconds, the sub-milliseconds, are those initial build times or rebuilds based on taking advantage of the caching that you have? Yeah, so the builds I showed are totally the rebuild times, which are aimed to be the fastest. Because when you're working on a project, you want the rebuild times to be really quickly. Now, some of the transforms, like Babel or JS Hint or JSCS, are unfortunately slow. Um, but what we've done is we've split the boot times into two different categories. We have created um, the default cold boot. So basically, you're starting the application for the first time. You've just installed new dependencies. Um, the cold boot time can be extremely slow. So for that big application, that's about two or 300,000 lines of code. The cold boot time is about 60 to 70 seconds. Um, this isn't the end of the world, but it definitely isn't cool, especially if you're changing branches and making code changes. Um, so recently, we introduced the concept of persistent filters, uh, and they can actually recover on those cold boots. So that same application that took 70 to 80 seconds to boot takes about 10 seconds with a warm cached boot. Um, we can probably reduce that time again by virtualizing the symlinks and reducing the I.O. operations. But 10 seconds is within the realm of reasonable, I think. Yeah, especially for the first time. Talk a little bit about some of your techniques for improving the initial pipe build. OK. Um, so uh, Broccoli has had some tricky performance issues, um, mostly because of visibility into what was actually taking a lot of time. Uh, as developers, we're kind of bad at actually gauging what performance issues 
are truly affecting us without good metrics. So when I first looked at the problem, I assumed it was X. And everyone assumed that it was Y or A, and everyone had their own opinions. In terms of everyone's opinions were partially correct. Um, but in the end, the only thing that um, taking a wild guess will often result in even worse performance. And there are a lot of attempts where people made one path fast, another path slow. Um, so instead, I took some time. Yahoo was gracious enough to give me the time to write a whole bunch of metrics tools to figure out exactly which plugin was doing which IO operations, which plugin was taking which times. Uh, and also those visualizations I showed you um, were have been super invaluable in figuring out exactly what takes let me grab one of the visualizations here. Um, so the, the TLDR is things were slow. Um, every time someone made a guess, they may have been right or they may have made it worse. Uh, so rather than making a bunch of guesses, spending a little bit of time to create the tooling, the visualization of the tooling to be able to look at it and figure out, uh, our brains are really good at pattern matching if we give them the right inputs. So uh, by creating those tools, it was actually entirely obvious that majority of the time was spent in uh, one of three different categories. And by addressing each one of them systematically, the build times were reduced. Um, before the performance work was done, that particular application had 20 to 30 second incremental builds. And now it's, it's, it's sub-second. Um, any, any other questions? No, I'm just going to quickly open up the. The screenshot of oh, wrong one. Uh, I can post these online if anyone cares. But if you have an Ember CLI application uh, and are using the master of Ember CLI or the version that they released at the end of the week, you can actually start the app in a way where it'll produce this output. Um, turns out to be kind of nice for debugging build performance, uh, and also maybe something went wrong with the build pipeline. Seeing it visually is a um, a great tool to figure out what's going on. Oh, one, one more thing. When Joe Liz, uh, the original author of Broccoli, who still maintains it, um, thought about Broccoli, this is the build pipeline she was envisioning. Um, and these, these totally work. And they work so well that we immediately put for loops around everything. And we ended up with these mega massive oops. <laughs> That's a funny picture that I didn't feel was too appropriate to, to show. So we ended up with these like super massive builds. So this is Ember.js. For example, all the various build times that all the various build steps that it does. Um, but yeah, thank you for being patient. If you guys have questions out of band, feel free to let me know. Uh, and if you're considering broccoli and aren't quite sure if it's the right tool for you, uh, come talk to me. I'll probably give you a somewhat biased opinion, but um, I can at the very least uh, provide you a good mechanism of usual, utilizing broccoli uh, versus using another tool that isn't going to be as good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your time. So uh, just to, to reintroduce Godfrey, he's a Rails core team member, been working lately on Ember's on, on Glimmer, uh, which is Ember's new rendering engine. And narrowly stole the best Canadian talk prize at last year's EmberConf from, from Steph. So try again next year. Yeah, you'll... All right. Uh, OK. So uh, I guess we'll start. So I am I'm Godfrey. You can find me on the internet as changing code. I work for a company called Tilder in Portland. Um, and I occasionally work on some open source stuff. I, whoa, what just happened? Let's see. OK, we're back. Uh, I'm a member of the Rails core team. And as Mike mentioned, I recently started um, contributing to Ember. And as some um, others have mentioned, I'm actually a Canadian. but um, thank you. Uh, I recently moved to Portland. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I have to move to Portland. But um, they, they, they have to. Well, Portland is great, but like, it's not, not Canada, right? Um, they, maple syrup, right? 
Yeah, yeah they, they don't have that. Um, my, in order for them to get, get me a visa, they have to put like engineer on the, on the what, what is happening. Uh, that's a different board. That's a different set of board. Okay. Computers. Because I want to move the other laptops a little to the. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you I'll, to, to I'll try not to touch anything. Try to stand the water. Hmm. It's working there, but ah, the, the projector has been turned off for some reason. Uh, I guess we should turn that back on. Uh, so, how's the food? <laughs> I haven't had any, so whatever you say, I'll eat. Okay. Hold on, it has a warm up, I'm sorry. Okay. You can still see it, there's like three other screens that can I see, but I see a light blinking, so that seems like a good sign. Actually, you can see it from there, so maybe we can just continue for now. Lights are not actually very important. Okay. Um, right. So, um, in order for them to, I, I assume this will eventually just work. So, like, in the meantime, hopefully, you can just look at that. Um, yeah, they they have to put engineer on my on my contract to get me a visa. But my actual job title is the in-house Canadian, and I basically just go around and apologize to people. Uh, <laughs> and um, when I'm not doing that, I basically just pitch everyone how good Canada is. For example, we invented the original smartphone. Um, <laughs> and um, we have we have an amazing healthcare system. So it's, as you can see, I came from Vancouver and this is a the um, this is a view of the Vancouver downtown. As you can see, it's full of luxury hospital buildings. <laughs> um, we are also the second largest country um, in the entire world, apparently. Um, although if you read carefully, most of it is actually water. But um, because we're a very big country, we have a lot of land. So um, as you can see, um, our parking slots are very wide. Um, <laughs> and I figure if I just showed you that picture, it would you wouldn't believe me, so I took another one. Uh, as you can see, there are actually no driver in the car. I actually went away for for lunch, like I, it, it was in the shopping mall. So I went away for lunch, and then one hour later, it's still there. Um, and as a courtesy, I have blurred the license plate in case you cannot see it. So as you can see, it's been blurred. Um, anyway, I think we should probably get to the actual talk, which is. HTML bars, how do I even, that's the talk we're um, looking today. Um, when I agreed to do this talk, which is like probably three months ago, um, I was told to write an abstract for this talk. And at the time, I literally have no idea what I'm talking about. So I wrote this abstract. I was I was really proud of it. If you haven't seen it, you should look at it. <laughs> and if you don't get it, hopefully you'll get it by the time um, we are done today. So, um, HTML, um, probably one of God's greatest gift to the mankind. <laughs> um, and what is even better than HTML? Um, in 1997, Microsoft released Internet Explorer 4.0 to the world, and we have um, the next version of HTML called the HTML. Um, it stands for Dynamic HTML. Um, what actually happened is in Internet Explorer 4, that was the first version of basically any browser that has um, something close to the DOM API as you know it today. It was the first browser to have basically the entire, um, like every node in your page model inside the DOM API. Like before that, there was Nescape and stuff. You can do documents.forms and then it will give you an array of stuff. But IE4 was the first version that has everything. What that means is um, you can use JavaScript or um, they would probably call it JScript at the time. Um, to dynamically 
create stuff on the page or modify them. So as you can see, perhaps you have um, an array of to-do items, perhaps you got that from your server, um, and you would like to render that on the screen. So you would create some LI elements and create some text notes with the title of the to-do, and if it's completed, you can wrap it with a delete tag, and um, you can append everything to the, to the parent. Um, but if you read the if you read the code here, you probably won't really relate this with HTML. Like you can't really see the HTML in there. So in order to do this, you have to learn two things, right? Like you have to have the the DOM model in your head. You have to understand that, and you like also have to understand HTML, which you program in most of the time. Um, so if you if you prefer to use HTML, you probably do something like this. Um, where you have string and you incrementally concatenate things to the string and um, build up a large string of HTML and then at the end you would use inner HTML to apply that to the DOM. So this is slightly better. You can see some HTML in there and it roughly correlates to um, the structure, the rough structure of the HTML you would have written in the first place if this is static. Um, but you can do a little bit better. Um, perhaps you can use some um, some string templates with um, placeholder values, and it's very clear that what you intend to do. And by the time it comes to rendering them on the screen, you can just use like regular expressions or whatever to um, replace the placeholders with the actual content. So if you can see at the third line from the bottom, like I'm using the replace function to replace the placeholder with the title from um, to-do item. So fundamentally, what you're trying to do here is really that you have some data in, um, like you have some data in JavaScript, right? and then you want to um, render that into HTML. So the plus in the middle is important because you're really, you have these two um, somewhat unrelated thing and you somehow have to um, glue the two things together. So as you can see, you, there are multiple ways you can do this manually or you can just use templates. That's what templates are for. Um, basically gluing your data to your HTML. So um, many years since Internet Explorer 4, um, there came a library called Mustache, which introduced um, the concept of logicless, well, it didn't invent the concept of logicless templates, right? But it popularized it for um, for front end development. So this is what it looks like. So instead of writing your menu JavaScript imperative JavaScript code, you can just write a template and say for each item in the items array, um, if it's completed, um, then show this thing. If it's not completed, show the the other thing. And it will basically just do all the string interpolations for you and give you um, an HTML string that you can um, apply to DOM with inner HTML. So that's great. Um, but there are a few problems. First of all, this is somewhat strange syntax that you have to learn. And um, for example, in the pound um, helper, there in the pound block things, um, it depends on what completed is, like depends on what the variable is. Like if it's a, an array, it would do one thing. As you can see, if it's an array, like um, in the pound items case, it would loop through everything. And if it's like Boolean, it would do something else. If it's an object, it would do some other thing. So it's kind of tricky to understand, and it's not very, um, it's not very extensible. So, um, Later, um, Yehuda wrote this library called Handle Bars. It's also a t-shirt, as you can see. Um, so it turns out what we want is not logicless template. Um, the tagline for Handle Bars is semantic template. What you actually want is um, not have crazy super nested if statements inside your template, but some of them are because the, ultimately what you want to do is to look at a template and immediately understand what is going on. So this is 
Like there's some logic in here, but it's pretty understandable, right? Like for each item in the items array, you, if something, do something else, do something else, that seems fine. So um, basically the, um, there are a few key differences um, from um, Mustache. So the first difference is extensibility. So instead of hard coding the pound um, syntax to mean different things depending on the variable, um, handlebars basically just let you define whatever block helper you want. So you can define an each helper, you can define an if helper, and uh, you can also define other custom helpers, which maybe we'll see later. But um, so that's one of the cornerstones for um, handlebars. But perhaps more importantly, um, handlebars introduced the concept of precompilation. So how much work is basically in the browser, you would look at the template, you would parse it in the browser, and then you would do something that's most more or less equivalent to the to the GSUP version that I showed you earlier. Um, what handlebars recognize is that, well, actually, um, your temp most of your template doesn't change. And like, basically, there's some static parts to it, there's some dynamic parts to it. So you can actually parse the template on the server side and compile that into, um, um, basically separate all the static parts from the dynamic part. And um, at runtime, all you have to do is give it the right data and the JavaScript function can um, just execute from top to bottom and give you the right string. So um, I think at the time, according to Yakuda, this is like easily 10 times faster than Mustache. So that is basically the contribution of handlebars. So great, we have templates, we have handlebars, we like them, we would like to use them. Um, at the time, there's a JavaScript framework for building large apps called Sprout Core. This is the logo of Sprout Core. Um, and because templates are great, so Yakuda basically look at Sprout Core and say, hmm, it would be nice if we can use um, templates for Sprout Core. So they added templates. They tried adding templates to um, Sprout Core and make it Sprout Core 2, but um, it turns out fundamentally this is pretty different from the philosophy and the architecture of Sprout Core and it didn't work very well. So after that experiment, Amber was born. It's basically a fork of Sprout Core that's rewritten to add. Um, it's basically rewritten from the ground up for to orient itself um, around the idea of templates, and more importantly, um, it's around the idea of. Um, turns out, you actually most of us actually want to write HTML and CSS, and you don't actually want to overly abstract that away from the user. It's fine to. Um, let people write HTML and CSS. So those are um, the two founding principles of Ember, I guess. Um, but there's a problem. So this is a handlebar template on the left, and this is some data on the right. Um, if you run the handlebars runtime on the two pieces, and you'll get something like this at the bottom of the slide. Now, if you pay attention to the top right, um, then you will see that the data has changed. When the data has changed, you probably want to update your template to reflect that. So you probably want the bottom part to look more like this after the update. But how do we get there? Now, the obvious solution is you can literally take the template and you take the data and you run it through again. You will get a new string and you can use inner, inner HTML to replace whatever was previously rendered. So that works. That's roughly how um, Backbone works if, you, if you're using templates in Backbone. But there are problems with that. Um, turns out that there are a lot of states in the DOM that are not captured anywhere, like the scroll position of the page. Right. So if you're on the middle of the page and then you change some data and rendered in higher page, you'll lose your scroll position and you'll be back to the top of the page. And that's not very nice. And also that's pretty wasteful because for a large app, you probably have many, many things on the screen. And if all you need is to update one small piece, it doesn't make sense to do all the work to tear down the entire page just to get to that small piece. So um, 
at the time, Ember tried various approaches and eventually arrived at this approach called Metamorph Script Tech. So basically the idea is um, in order to update something in a DOM, you need to know where to update. So um, every time you see a pair of curlies, you can, you can insert some placeholders before and after that. And so whenever anything changed, you can just like do um, document.element by ID, find that placeholder, and then replace the content in between the placeholder. Um, this is not terrible. Um, it's better than a lot of the, the alternatives. For example, you could have imagined that perhaps you can just insert a span around the curlies, and so now you have a thing to point to. But inserting a span is a pretty invasive thing. In, inserting a span for every curlies is a pretty invasive thing. It changes <laughs> your CSS, um, and it has many other side effects. And um, there are some problems with the script tag approach, um, like it. In some edge cases, it would also break your CSS, but it's a lot more <laughs> confined than um, just randomly adding diffs and spans around things. And also, um, this approach works in a lot of contexts that um, diff and spans doesn't work. So, for example, if you have, if that thing is wrapping a table row, you cannot wrap a table row with a diff that doesn't work. So, this is not that bad, but it's it's still kind of ugly and make people pretty sad. Um, there is a bigger problem than that, though. Um, so if you look at this, like the script tags are almost valid anywhere as an element on the page. But unfortunately, you might want to do something like find an attribute to um, a variable. In that case, obviously, you cannot insert a script tag inside the attribute, like inside the class attribute, right? So in order to do that, um, Ember would have to make you use the find adder, find adder helper instead, and um, it would result in something like that. So you still need a you still need a placeholder thing to refer to the position. So you have a data attribute in there. Um, so this is probably one of the first thing you would want to do, or um, one of the things that you would do very quickly when you're writing an app. And unfortunately. Um, because we need some way to update the things dynamically, um, Ember makes you jump through this hoop and it introduces a lot of um, cognitive overhead for new users and stuff. And that's also made a lot of people very sad. Um, unfortunately, the nice thing about Keynote is that you cannot change the slides until your animations are over. So <laughs> there we go. Um, but, it's it's although it's a little bit annoying. It's important to keep in mind the pers the, the correct context and the framing perspective, right? So handlebars was built before um, Ember was built. So handlebars was a string-based template engine, and handlebars was built, and we wanted to do we wanted to use templates, so we retrofit that into Sprout Core, and we have Ember. Um, and we were able to find some creative solutions to work around the problems, and it got us really far. Like, I mean, handlebars was a number from three whatever version until 1.9 or 1.10, so it lasted many years, and it basically achieved most of the things that people wanted to do. But given the experience building Ember from 1.0 pre version one up until 1.9. Um, the Amber team has learned a lot of things. Basically, they know exactly what the requirements of Ember is. So um, with that knowledge, you can fix all the things. And HTML bars was born. The basic idea is instead of compiling your templates into a function that um, return a DOM, that return HTML string, you can just re you can just compile the template into a function that create DOM stuff in um, directly, which is similar to what you would have done in the first place using the DOM API. So this is a very high level explanation of how it works. Um, if you want more lower level explanation, 
basically you have a template and you run that through an HTML tokenizer and you get a stream of HTML tokens and then you feed each of those HTML tokens into handlebars parser and you have a combined is, um, abstract syntax tree of HTML and handlebars um, and then you run that through the HTML bars compiler, you get some opcodes and then you run it through another HTML bars compiler and you get a JavaScript program. Um, that is actually not important, but I just put that on the slide so you will know that there's a lot of stuff going on here. But what is important is that we have now found a way to um, remove the needs of metamorph tag. So you, like if you write an Ember app today using HTML bars, you would no longer see those script tags on your page and there's a massive CSS on the screen. Um, you also don't need to use the find adder, uh, find adder helper. You can just directly use curlies and your attributes and that's great. Um, so those are the motivating things for HTML bars, but um, because we now understand, like we have DOM awareness, we actually understand what the template is talking about in relation to the HTML um, that they're, in relation to DOM, the DOM that they're trying to build, we can actually do a lot of smarter things. For example, we can do smarter HTML escaping. Um, if you if you're using cur if you're using a pair of curlies inside an attribute position um, in older handlebars, if you if even if you don't care about um, even if you don't care about uh, making the attribute bindable, um, we will still have to um, escape them using like HTML entities escape. Um, but that's actually not necessary. So for example, now that we know you're talking about an attribute, we don't have to escape them the same way. Um, on the other hand, if you're talking about the style attribute, we can do some extra escaping that um, protects you against CSS injection attacks. So that's pretty nice. Um, we can also, because we have a real AST that describes the template, we can also run some AST transforms on it. So Ember used this behind the scenes a lot to um, translate your, basically if you have an, a template written before HTML bars was introduced, um, it would still work um, when Ember switched to HTML bars in 1.10 or something like that. Um, and part of the reason that works is we now understand what the template is talking about so we can um, dynamically remove stuff or like at compile time we can remove stuff that it's no longer relevant without you actually having to change your templates physically. Um, and because we have a real HTML parser, we can do a lot more things. And when I say HTML parser, it's not actually limited to HTML. It basically supports everything in the HTML spec and the SVG spec. So, um, for example, SVG now works correctly with HTML parser, and I can quickly show you a demo. So I think I requires refresh. So this is basically um, a screen with some event listener and then draw some circles on the screen. Um, looks cool, I guess it's it's kind of ported from a React demo, but the precise reason we, we did this is not very important. But what's more important is that um, this is how it actually looks. So this is the template for that thing. So basically, you can just write the template and say, um, okay, for each point on a screen, I would like to draw a circle with different sizes and stuff. And this is all you have to do, and everything works correctly. Which is um, another thing that the HTML bars project did is to lay out a better foundation for future improvements. Um, what actually happened is after HTML bars has shipped, um, roughly a year later, we launched a new pro like we did a new project called Glimmer, um, which basically borrowed a lot of ideas from React. Um, one of the key contributions of React is the program model. So this is how you would write a component in React, the equivalent to do component. Um, so the key idea here is that um, if you look at if you look at a template like this, um, I would actually rather this to be a, a template, but this is readable. Um, 
if you if you read the template like this, it's very it's fair relatively easy to understand how um, this results in um, the DOM on the screen. Um, whereas if you have to think about what happens when you update something, you have to change a particular slot on the screen that's more difficult to think about. So the trick um, that React presents is basically, um, you, as a programmer, you can just assume that this render function will be called every time when ev anything changes. So um, your mental model is everything would just re-render all the time on the screen, and all you have to think about is how do I build a, the DOM I want from scratch every time, which is pretty nice. And the way you make that work is by diffing. So basically, the first time you, when you run the render function, you have created a DOM tree, and then you can memorize that, keep that somewhere in memory. Um, and when something changes, you run the render function again, and then you get a new tree, and then you compare the two trees and see what actually changed and apply those changes into the DOM. And that was possible because um, instead, like the render function doesn't actually immediately put things into the DOM. The, what the render function returns is um, a virtual DOM tree, which is some in-memory data structure that looks like DOM, but it's a lot cheaper to manipulate and create. Now, if you know something about algorithms, you might realize that to correctly diff two trees and figure out the correct insertion, like the correct operations to transform a tree, uh, transform one tree to another, is an n cube algorithm. That means basically, if you have 100 nodes on this, if you have 100 DOM nodes, that would be like 100 cube operation. Like that. it will require that many operations and that would be not very scalable. Uh, fortunately, they have found some heuristics to basically um, limit the number of comparisons you do. So you only have, if you have 100 DOM nodes on the screen, you only have to do um, in something in the order of magnitude of 100 operations times some constants, um, which is pretty cool. On the other hand, Google um, is also working on a thing called incremental DOM. It basically looks like this. It also uses the always be rendering strategy. So um, the difference is that um, instead of producing a virtual DOM, this render function would basically just produce um, a series of instructions. On, like it would, instead of, yeah, instead of producing a DOM, um, you're directly programming against the DOM instructions. So it's a lot easier to diff. And um, instead of creating um, some very big virtual DOM trees in memory, um, you can just diff them as you run these instructions. So it uses a lot less memory. Um, you might think the API is a little bit weird, but that's okay because they position themselves as a, a compilation target or ASM.DOM, as they would call it. Um, so those are two pretty cool projects. Um, the time order is not exactly correct, but basically Glimmer took some of the best ideas from the two projects. Um, uh, Glimmer is an improvement on the Ember, on, sorry, on the HTML bars um, project. It's a new rendering engine for Ember that builds on the foundation of HTML bars. So um, it takes the same always be a rendering program model, um, but it doesn't actually use a virtual DOM. So it turns out that the cool thing about virtual DOM or what React and incremental DOM has taught us is that reading from the DOM is expensive. So you should not um, be pulling the DOM for comparisons. That would be very slow. Um, what you actually want to do is only write to the DOM, only figure out the exact changes you need to apply to the DOM and do those things. So in other words, you want to have a write-only algorithm. Um, how you get to those instructions is actually not that important. So virtual DOM is not inherently the key thing to make React work. The diffing is the, the, diffing is the actual important thing. Um, I guess I will have to quickly go through these slides. Um, it turns out that we have semantics templates, so um, perhaps we can do a lot better than um, simply diffing everything. As you can observe, a lot of these things doesn't actually change 
all the things that could change um, is basically everything that's in the curlies. So it would be very unfortunate if you have a very deeply nested tree of DOM, but you only have one piece that could possibly change. It would be unfortunate if you have to diff all the way down just to see if that one thing has changed. Um, perhaps you're using bootstrap or something and have a lot of wrappers. Um, the more unfortunate thing is perhaps you have a very complex um, DOM that doesn't actually have anything dynamic in there. So this is obviously a very contrived example, but perhaps you have like a, a footer for your site that has a lot of nesting, um, but doesn't actually contain any dynamic parts. So it would be unfortunate if in, every time you have to re-render, you have to diff all those things that didn't change. Um, turns out we have a compiler and we can actually do that. The way it works is render nodes. So basically the compiler will look at the templates and see that, oh, actually there are only three to four things that actually changes. So we can, after the initial render, we can collect a list of random nodes that basically have a reference to um, the DOM node that they are pointing to. And you can, um, like you know what statement to re-execute and the last value. So basically every time when you re-render, you basically just have to re-execute all statements with the new data and see if the value has changed. If the value has changed, you know you need to update that particular DOM node, but otherwise you're good to go. So in the case of where you have a very deeply nested tree of DOM with only one piece that could change, you only have one uh, render node. So whenever anything changes, you only have to do one thing and check if you need to update the DOM. And even better, if you have nothing dynamic in your DOM, then there's nothing diff. So that's a key observation of Glimmer. And um, as you can see, Glimmer is an old N algorithm, but there's a fine print. And it's actually the number of dynamic things you have in your template, not the number of DOM nodes. So um, Yahoo and Tom tribute Glimmer on, um, on stage at the Embercon keynote last, uh, this year. And um, eventually we have shipped um, most of the apps didn't have to change anything and they got a lot faster. Great. Um, but um, while I'm working, while I was working on this talk, um, Yahude and I were working on a new refactor of Glimmer that's called Glimmer 2. So um, everything I've wrote about um, my talk so far has, almost everything I've wrote about has changed. And, so um, Yehuda would like to tell you about some of the things that we're working on in Glimmer 2 land at, um, right now. So here's Yehuda. You still need the other laptop up there? Move your laptop over now so you Yep, do not worry. I'm just getting everything going. Mm, so I feel like there's a way to read, uh, but I'm actually not probably not going to feel so Okay, so um, the, uh, the key story about uh, Glimmer 2 is that what Glimmer 1 effectively did is it focused a lot on re-rendering. And if you looked at the DB Monster demo, what you'll see is that the re-rendering got much faster. I think probably it would not be an exaggeration to say it got at least 10 times faster. So <clears throat> re-rendering got a lot faster for the reasons Godfrey talked about. And um, in real world applications, it's actually not that uncommon if you look at all the templates in big applications to see a lot of templates that are totally static. Part of the reason for that is that every block that contains that, like an if statement or an each statement, everything inside of that is a template. So a lot of times, you may end up with an if statement, but then everything inside the if statement is totally static. So re-rendering that is free um, on, at the re-rendering pass. And that, that actually adds up a lot in, in real world examples, even the DB Monster example, which is extremely dynamic, right? So huge amounts of the DB Monster demo are curlies that are actually doing something. In the real world, there's just a certain amount of markup that exists that is necessary to render things. And that markup is just uh, not part of the re-rendering process at all in Glimmer. In Glimmer. Um, 
the observation of Glimmer 2 was that, so we built Glimmer 1, we built HTML bars, and part of the process of doing that was just actually integrating it with Ember. So we built HTML bars, which was the, the rendering layer, and then we said, okay, we gotta go integrate it with Ember. Um, and so we started to add things on top of, of HTML bars to make it work with Ember. Uh, one of the things that we did is we created a, uh, what's called a stream system, um, and that's basically a way of uh, remembering what you saw the first time so you could run it again, um, and remembering if something is dirty or not, it hooks into the observer system. Um, we did a whole bunch of uh, component system, right? So the first version of HTML bars doesn't really have components, so we have to build those inside of Ember. Um, the whole block system was basically added at, at sort of the last minute to make the component system work. So we effectively did a bunch of integration on top of the HTML bar system. And that actually worked okay. Um, one, and, and it was, like I said, it was much faster re-rendering. One of the unfortunate consequences though was that initial render, especially right after we launched Glimmer 1, initial render was much slower. Now initial render is getting to be comparative, comparable to uh, before, but initial render is still somewhat slower than it was before, even though re-render is faster. And sort of the uh, unfortunate thing about that is that the whole point of Glimmer was to make it possible to do things that use the re-render all the time programming model. But of course, in, since before Glimmer, it was so slow, nobody was actually doing that in the real world, right? So what that meant is that everyone's app got slower, even though the hypothetical performance of an Ember app got much faster. Um, so everybody was very sad. Um, so, so the point of Glimmer 2 is basically to say, okay, now that we have actually done a complete integration of the Glimmer hypothesis, right? Um, how do we actually make it performant on initial render? And Probably the biggest picture um, idea that we came up with in order to do that is to say, um, so Godfrey talked a lot about uh, us having a compiler, and it turns out that it is very nice to have a compiler. There's a certain amount of things that you could guess ahead of time and do ahead of time. But uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of doing things in a compiler is that you sort of locked in whatever decisions you made on the server and you can't actually change them anymore in the client. And, uh, because of the fact that all the optimizations in Glimmer 1 were done at this layer, we had this hard choice between um, how big can we make a template, how expensive can we make it, how many hard-coded decisions can we make, versus uh, the consequential cost of not making an optimization on the server. So that was a very hard choice, and quite often we ended up just having to settle with something that wasn't so optimal. So one of the main goals of Glimmer 2 is basically to say, we're just gonna give, instead of taking the opcodes and converting them into something compiled on the server, we're just gonna ship those down to the client. And we'll let the client look at them. The client can do something dumb at first, but then the client can learn what it's looking at and do something smart, um, which is sort of the equivalent of like an interpreter in a programming language, which eventually goes and gets things, right? So the idea is we won't try to guess a lot on the server what's going on. That means the payload is very small. The payload is just basically the template um, already pre-processed into opcodes. And then the client is going to see what's going on. So um, what is, the, what is basically the main consequence of this? The main consequence of this is that um, instead of Ember having to sort of uh, glom on top of a system that was hard-coded to work a certain way, um, Ember can sort of sneak in and make changes on the fly. Um, additionally, uh, the first version of HTML bars, there was sort of a, a strict layering between HTML bars, which was basically the templating engine, the DOM part, and Ember, which is, the, like I said, the component layer, um, all the helper system, the container system, and all that. And um, I'm gonna actually not. Um, and in, uh, in Glimmer 2, we actually took a lot of the things that were, we added on sort of after the fact in Ember, and we made them part of the core experience of Glimmer itself. And the idea behind that is that we don't, you don't have to worry so much, um, no, Ember doesn't have to worry so much about sort of tacking things on after the fact if the core concepts are integrated into the system. Um, and one of the, four things that we took from Ember and moved into Glimmer is this concept of references. So earlier, Godfrey showed um, this example. In this example, you have a template, and what it produces as a side effect of building it is this array of render nodes. And the render node has a pointer back to the node and a statement, right? And so the idea is that conceptually, you're basically re-executing that statement every time, checking to see if it's changed, and then updating it only if you have it. And the concept of a reference is actually just a slight tweak. Um, so Ember, already has this concept in it called, it's called a stream uh, today. We, that's what it was called in the current version of Ember. And the idea behind the stream is basically that um, you take 
let's say you have a statement that says uh, post that author, you basically remember, okay, I post that author needs to be needs to execute this code, and um, here's the last value that I saw. Here's if it's dirty or not. It could easily hook into the observer system in Ember and things like that. And uh, Ember used a, ver a mode in HTML bars called uh, linked linked mode, which was based, which was not part of any was not part of really the core. And so that ended up also becoming like an ex extensions on top of extensions on top of extensions. Um, but in Glimmer 2, references are sort of baked in. So what Glimmer 2 produces is a reference. And uh, in instead of what we saw here, a statement, which is basically some abstract thing, um, if your uh, environment is asked to produce a reference, which has a value function. You can call the value, get the value, and a is dirty function, um, which basically tells you whether the thing is dirty or not. Um, so, at an abstract level, nothing much has changed here. Um, the big difference, the big change uh, to making references built in, well, there are two of them. So, first of all, now that it's baked into Glimmer itself, it's not a tacked on thing, which means it's easier for it to become optimized as part of the whole, the whole system. But more importantly, uh, when you use, let's say, immutable JS in React, uh, what that means is that you, there are certain optimizations that you could perform because of the fact that you're using immutable JS, right? You know that for this entire subtree, nothing inside of this immutable JS can change. So as long as the only values that you use inside of some subtree come from immutable JS, uh, magically you can basically skip the entire subtree. Sorry. And similarly, if you use uh, like an Ember style ob observer system, um, then you know whether something has changed and you could avoid doing some work based on whether it changed. But what every other system other than Glimmer 2 does is it hard codes a certain Worldview into the system. So, um, for example, in React, you can use immutable JS and uh, get the optimization as long as all the data used inside of your subtree is still immutable JS, right? So you can't say I'm going to use immutable JS for 98% of the things, but 2% of the time I actually need to use a regular object. As soon as you use a regular object, you're breaking the entire um, optimization. So you have to say I'm going to use immutable JS all the way down. Um, and the idea behind references is that it takes those questions, those, the, the optimizations that you can perform, like I know for a fact that this thing can never change, and it lets you um, install them on a per object basis, right? So an object can say, uh, here's the reference for my object and my property, and because I'm immutable JS, I know that that can never change. So I'm always going to return false for is dirty, and I, pro and I can be sure that that's going to be true. But maybe Ember does a different thing. Maybe Ember's object model returns a reference that says, um, it's dirty only if someone didn't call dot set on it. And maybe if you're using POJOs, maybe you actually have to do a dirty check. But you can now mix and match these different systems freely. Maybe if you can use immutable JS 98% of the time, you get the optimization 98% of the time. And maybe 2% of the time, you just do dirty checking, do regular angular dirty checking. And that's fine. Um, so the idea is that this, this object is baked into Glimmer now. And the idea is that it is able to represent the trade-offs that people want you to make at the component level, but in at a much lower level. Okay. So uh, another thing is uh, components. So in in the first version of HTML bars, there was sort of the idea that components existed at sort of a very abstract level, but they weren't baked in, which meant that Ember effectively built the entire component model on top, and for various and sundry reasons, it was slow. Um, and now components are faster. Um, and components are baked in at a lower level. So I want to show you a demo, but I first want to show you, before I show you something appearing on the screen, uh, I want to show you what the code looks like. Hopefully I can, no, how do I make this bigger? And all equal, okay, there we go. So I basically, so this is basically a demo. Um, it's using Glimmer 2, which, also for various and sundry reasons, it's not public yet, but like tomorrow, hopefully. Um, and basically what this does is it is all written in Glimmer 2, but it's using a lot of what you would normally have expected to see in Ember. So what we have here is a, an Ember component, and it has a computer property. So this is a regular computer property, um, and it's called updates. And you can see that it goes and gets some attributes and does a, a reduce for the total updates. There's also a streak, which is also a computer property. Um, it, it defines its uh, dependent keys like you would expect in Ember, and it's basically producing the streak. Um, and then uh, we have an uptime day, and that thing basically says, okay, what is my color? My color depends on whether I'm up or not, and my memo depends also on whether I'm up or not, also computer properties. Um, 
And now what you can see is that we've registered a component called server uptime. This is basically just a uh, emulation of the Ember container system, but it's effectively equivalent. Uh, server uptime is a class we saw before, and then we compile, and you can see that we're basically using many of the things that you would use in Ember. Um, similarly, uptime day is a thing, um, and here's the top level app, which basically loops through all the servers and uh, puts in a server uptime component. So this is using uh, Glimmer components, angle bracket components, but you're getting a component for each server, and then you're getting a uh, an uptime day component for each day. So that's uh, somewhere down here. I generate the data. It's 365 days, so it's a lot of components. Um, and so I can show you it working. So. So this is basically effectively the equivalent of the DB Monster demo. If I scroll down, you'll see that there's 10. Every one of those boxes is a component, right? So there's a lot of components here. And if I look at it, you'll see that the first initial render took about a second for 3,600 components, and the re-render takes about uh, somewhat under 200 milliseconds normally. Um, and just for fun, I rewrote the same exact demo in React. Um, and I'm not going to show you that we're faster than React, sorry to say. Well, I might a little bit show you that. Um, so if I play over here, it's the same demo. I'll show you the code in a second. Um, you can see the initial rendering gets faster. The initial rendering is 600-ish uh, milliseconds. But the re-render is slower. The re-render is about 300 milliseconds. And this is not a cheat. I promise you that I, there, I basically did both of the demos start to finish without any, uh, any... I didn't think a lot about what things would be fast or slow in either system. And, and in fact, in the Ember case, I intentionally used a lot of computer properties for... Uh, because idiomatically, that's probably what you would do. Um, and for any people who know React in the room, um, I effectively did the, you know, roughly the right thing. So um, here's the, the code. It's basically an equivalent thing, right? And um, so I guess the TLDR of that demo is, uh, I think we're, of course, integrating things into Ember always adds some cost, and that certainly was true last time. I think we think that the cost will be much better this time, and hopefully seeing that, uh, there's a lot of things here that are parts of the core Ember experience, computer properties, and the object model, um, and uh, basically the whole reference system, which used to be called the stream system. That at least gives me some confidence that when we actually go to do the full-on integration, it will remain pretty fast. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I want to show the, um, the other demo, the Ripples demo, again. So, um, so this, there's nothing different than what Godfrey showed before. The only thing is that what Godfrey showed before happened because he didn't have this running on his laptop to be the other demo, uh, to, be, to be the old HTML bars demo. And so this is basically the same demo rewritten again with uh, using Glimmer 2. And the only really interesting thing about that is that, um, let me see if I can get view source. The only really interesting thing about that is that um, Glimmer 2 just contains a lot more of Ember than Glimmer 1, than HTML bars, right? So when you made an HTML bars demo, you were leaving out a lot of the important things that makes that makes that make the system slow. And the Glimmer 2 demo includes a lot of the things that make it could make it slow. Um, so here, you, there's the SVG here, right? It's a pound each. And the point is that this is this is a lot of a lot of integrated stuff that in that was kind of that kind of made the HTML bars demo a little bit of a cheat. Um, and if you look at it, I think the cool thing, the thing I like about this is it's basically just request animation frame, and it's just looping, making much of data, and then updating the main scope and re-rendering, and it basically does the thing that you would expect. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, it's also um, very 60 FPS, like it's pretty obvious that that's true, and that was that's definitely not always the case in Ember, so I'd be happy about all that. Um, I want to say that, uh, so we're doing a lot of this work on behalf of LinkedIn, and I believe they're hiring. I think we asked if they're hiring, and they said, yes, we're hiring, but only if you're good. <laughs> so I think everyone in this room is probably good. Um, so anyway, uh, LinkedIn's uh, funding a lot of this work. It's pretty great. I, it's definitely sort of a, a moonshot. Um, all of these things are always sort of big projects that take some time, and having somebody to just fund you to work on it for a few months to get from start to finish is pretty important. And especially because Ember is not a, you know, we're not hosted out of one giant company like basically every other one of our competitors. Getting a, a few 
uh, big companies to help fund chunks of it is good. And I, I personally prefer that. I find that that's a more robust and effective way of running open source projects anyway. Um, I guess you can get up to say the one more thing. There's a one more thing. Yeah. Um, I guess there's like this is not a real announcement or anything, but we, like, I just want to casually mention that um, throughout this exercise of refactoring Glimmer, we have been using um, TypeScript to write the framework, and it actually turned out to be pretty nice. Basically, um, the type system would guard you from a lot of errors that you could have made, so we would um, basically sit there, pair for like three, four hours straight, and then we'll finally get to a point where um, the compiler said there is no more type errors and we'll run the test and usually there will be like one or two failing tests but the only kind of failures you can get is because we forgot to initialize some variables because TypeScript doesn't actually guard you against um, nulls and undefines so but the, like it's 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 a little bit sad that that leaks but um, on the flip side it's pretty amazing that that's the only thing that so yeah, that's like when, once you get a system that actually mostly works, like when people say oh, you have a good type system, it basically means when you run it first time, it basically works. If you have a system that works like a good type system, except it doesn't guard you against nulls, and you notice that like every single time there was a problem that leaked through the type system was null, it's like, ah, yes, null, and turns out to be, it turns out null is in fact a bad thing. Um, I guess we should, we should mention that um, even like it, it was, it was pretty great for, um, Working on framework code because you have like a lot of code that you can possibly fit inside your of your head. So being able to um, get the get your editor to like jump to the right place or tell you the right things or basically self-document the internals is pretty nice. But that being said, um, I, I guess this is just not an announcement of like Ember Free will have TypeScript or whatever. Just like a fun thing to mention on the side. I think the main thing for me is that I in, I've enjoyed using TypeScript, especially for areas of the code that were very algorithm or data uh, structure heavy, um, and especially for areas that were pretty generic and had in, a lot of interfaces. And I, for sure, would like Ember to work better with TypeScript, but I also uh, have no interest whatsoever in making it. I feel like I, I was talking to Godfrey about this before, and I, I, what I want to say is I don't want to make it a thing that you need to use. Except everyone actually says that. Everyone's like, oh yeah, we're gonna use TypeScript, but that's not a mandatory thing. You can easily not use it. That is, and, and when they say that, they just mean like, if you want to stab a spoon through your eye, you can make it work. <laughs> that is not what I'm saying. I actually, I think uh, personally writing applications with in a dynamic way and basically focusing most of your brain on just getting something on the screen that you can play around with. And like, I, I don't know, I, I feel like for me, programming web applications, like when I work on Skylight, most of the time that I spend is like, okay, I have a, a design I want to make exist on the internet. Okay, let me try to make it work. Oh, I press the button and it doesn't feel good. Let me change it. Oh, maybe if I change this, we'll do this other thing. And the amount of time I want to spend at that moment on programming is actually quite low. But there are other points in time where I'm like, oh, this thing is actually a very complicated algorithm. I'm merging together two quantile digests in Skylight. At that point, I actually do want to program because every minute that I spend pretending I'm not programming is a minute that I end up with bugs later, right? And I just think these things coexist in the real world. And what I like, what I like about TypeScript is that you can sort of mix and match. You can decide to use type system if you want it, not if you don't. And I would like Ember to allow you to make that decision. But I don't want to say uh, we're going to use the type system for dependency injection or something. I don't. If you don't use the type system, it shouldn't have. It doesn't matter. Uh, it should be there to. Do what types what Microsoft wants it to be there for, which is to help you in your ID. It shouldn't be a mandatory part of it. Okay. Yeah. We can open up questions. If you guys have questions, you can use the microphone up there. I'll open it up. Uh, so uh, you uh, in the Ripples demo are doing animation in the run loop and everything else inside of Ember. Is that a recommended practice now? What are your thoughts on that? And how should you go from here? Uh, 
Uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, there's no like actual animation in the usual sense of the word. Like it's basically just like re render and like changes attributes on the SVG. So it's not like crazy, crazy, the crazy kind of animation. It's basically just a DBmon demo in, in SVG. Um, I guess the the reason we did like we did um, everything else of Ember is because this is a demo in the HTML bars repo and we don't have Ember. But um, ideally, using Ember like using Ember run loop and stuff wouldn't make that slow. Um, and it was not done because of like any performance, whatever. This is actually um, if you look at the performance benchmark of this, if you look at the profile, it's actually the JavaScript part of this is actually well under 60 frames per second. So whenever, for some reason, it doesn't get 60 frames per second, usually like browser limitations. So um, yeah, I guess the, I would say it's sort of similar thing to what God was saying. I don't, generally speaking, I don't think it makes sense to use um, Ember for animations. Like data bindings and animations are not, is not going to be the most performant thing. But on the flip side, it seems like if you are able to easily represent something using this model and it's the most natural way to do it, it seems like it should be able to be performance. So that, it's a goal to make it performant, but like if you're doing an animation, you should probably use an animation library. And good animation libraries are also going to be abstract enough so that if there's a better thing that comes out in six months or a year, you can keep using the same code and have it do the right thing. Any other questions? Steph? I'm curious, the, de the demo that you did, the not deep, I don't know, the, squ the what are going to call it, the square, green squares demo? Yeah. Um, you didn't say what the current performance oh, I of current number I honestly there. didn't actually test it because I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so are you an order of magnitude embarrassed? Are you? Well, we, I, we discussed possibly doing it. I don't know the answer. We, we would have done it, but we ran off. Yeah, we expect that it's slow. Maybe expect that it's more slow. Yeah. So I, when, when do we expect to use this? I, I'm, I'm asking because I'm curious. Uh, no, so this is so good. So seeding thing. That's that a good, I will about. take the softball. Um, I, so I started working on this probably two months ago or something like that. And it's been a private repo in large part because I don't like I don't like making something a public repo and then having the hype be very large for the entire time that you're working on it. Um, a lot of people have access to it though. Uh, we're gonna make it public, I think, like this week. But the requirement for making it public for me is that there is actually a start of an integration in the Ember repository. And once we have a start of an integration in the Ember repository, we'll basically be back to the same old Glimmer One story, which is that we know how many tests we need to make tests, and then you'll know the answer. Um, the sort of the nice thing about Glimmer 2, like Glimmer 1 was kind of a crapshoot. It was like, we have no idea what it takes to integrate. One of the nice things about Glimmer 2 is that the actual core semantics are designed around what we, the complete set of things we, knew, we know we ended up needing, right? So when we built Glimmer 1, it was like, oh shit, like how does one implement a, this legacy controller semantics? I hadn't even thought of it, right? But in Glimmer 2, we know now what, we, we're just fresh off of having completed the first integration, so we know exactly what the set of things is, and the semantics, the scope, like, Glimmer 2 has, like, a scope object, and a frame object, and a, there's a real template object, and there's, like, an evaluation thing with the instruction point. There's basically all the things that ended up having to be hacked on at the end in, in Ember, and so I don't, I'm anticipating that it will be a relatively quick uh, integration, certainly quicker than the original Glimmer, which I think was I think we announced the original Glimmer in EmberConf, which was like in March, and actually landed it in complete integration form in May, and then took a few months to actually take out the bug. So I would expect it to be better than that. In other words, not next year. Hopefully not next year. That was a lot of words to say not tomorrow, but yeah, hopefully like early next year, or like it will actually be in a beta build. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.
Mr. Mike has an announcement about an event. Do you want to come up here? Uh, I don't need a mic. So the Windows Visual Studio team and NPM Inc. are hosting a, you know, using Node and NPM on Windows event. Uh, it's in San Francisco at the Microsoft Reactor on November 9th. So if any of you guys are stuck on your Windows machine, things are running slow, and you have feedback for the team, I know Microsoft has a bunch of open source developers that are eager to make that a much more experience. So if you happen to live up there or are interested, check it out November 9th. Um, we'll post a meetup link to this event um, from the Modern Review at Twitter feed. Thank you. And so our next meetup again is not going to be until January, but we are looking for other people to host. So if you think that your company would like to host, please come and find me or tweet at Modern Web UI. Also, I have some more Modern Web UI stickers here. We obviously have a lot of amazing uh, core team members and people who used Ember here. Uh, Eric's over there, Steph, um, Jay, if you want to talk about ES7. Is Jeff still here, Jeff? Jeff. Jeff Frost, yeah. Okay. Hi. So you also have an Angular core team member if you want to bother him about things. <laughs> um, yeah. And if anybody else I missed. And thank you again. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you soon.